This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. If you're a seeker, don't miss the inspiring book, Shamanic Awakening, Between the Dark and the Daylight. This remarkable work chronicles shamanic counselor and indigenously trained dream decoder Sander Cochran's 35 years of experience with diverse wisdom keepers throughout the Americas. Sandy's initiations across the British Isles, Turkey, Greece, and Egypt, combined with her knowledge of symbology, psychology, and myth, influence her dream blog and workshops. Sandy offers private readings, Sacred International Journeys, a meditative CD, and her book, Shamanic Awakening, to encourage you as you navigate your earthwalk and create a deeper connection to yourself. Find this and more at her website, starwalkervisions.com. Hi, Curious Minds. Welcome to CC with BB, connecting with coincidence with Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. That's me, the only radio show in the world dedicated to the study of coincidences, synchronicity, and serendipity. We are coming to you through X-Zone Broadcast Network, located in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and broadcasting all over the world. I'm a psychiatrist. I help people with medications and psychotherapy. I work with both minds and brains. Coincidences involve both your mind and your brain. You need your mind to experience coincidences and your brain to talk about them. How are mind and brain connected? Synchronicity spoken here. Serendipity followed here. Coincidences alert us to the mysterious hiding in plain sight. Put connecting with coincidence in your search engine and find my Psychology Today blog, my website, and my social media site. Yes, put connecting with coincidence in your search engine and you can find me in all those places. Would you like to know how sensitive you are to coincidences? Take the weird coincidence survey on my website. Today we'll be talking with an excellent clinician who is not only a great psychotherapist and a very, very good friend of mine, but also interested in a wide variety of ideas and experiences, including coincidences. And one of the, one of the things that Frank and I will talk about today are coincidences that take place in the psychotherapist's office. The most famous of these coincidences coincidences in the psychotherapist's office involve, of course, Carl Jung and his famous scarab story. Jung was dealing with a very difficult patient, difficult for him because she wouldn't listen to what he was trying to tell her. She was very stuck in rationality. Uh, in a scientific way of thinking about things and would not listen to Jung's more intuitive urgings to asking her to think more broadly about her own experiences. She brought in a dream as Jungian patients were often advised to do. And in that dream, she described a scarab. A scarab is an Egyptian beetle-like symbol of death and transformation which for her took the form of a scarabide piece of jewelry. This jewelry was very expensive to her, was golden, and had a lot of good feeling to her. As she described this piece of jewelry with the scarab on it, Jung heard a tap, tap, tapping on his window pane, went to his window, and this is in Zurich, Switzerland, 
and opened the window and found a scarab-like beetle sitting outside his window. Now, this scarab-like beetle, uh, Rose, uh, Rose Foster, is not very common in Switzerland anyway. And here it was showing up in Jung's office outside his window. He had been looking for something to help this woman stop being so rational, to release her from the cauldron of her extreme rationality. So he grabbed this scarab-like beetle and presented it to her as she talked about her dream. She was so startled by the coincidence, the synchronicity between her dream and what Jung had presented to her that according to Jung, the psychotherapy went far better afterwards. Well, Frank is going to tell us about a coincidence not unlike this in his office. I met Frank uh, through the Division of Perceptual Studies at the D Department of Psychiatry at the University of Virginia. The, the title, the per Division of Perceptual Studies, is a little misleading. It doesn't tell you really what we look at there. We study reincarnation and near-death experiences, as well as telepathy, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, and precognition, and other parapsychological ideas. It's the only place within a university within the United States that studies such things. It's a remarkable group, and its longevity over more than 30 years attests to its capacity to develop good research ideas and find ways to support it. Now DOPS is getting more out in public and having Frank on the program and for us talking about DOPS and how Frank got involved with it is going to be part of our discussion because the ideas that the Division of Perceptual Studies is focusing on are now becoming mainstream as my producer Rob McConnell really knows uh, as people get more and more interested in what he presents on X-Zone radio and, and other venues. We will be talking, uh, Frank and I, about how he began his interest in the, in the ideas of DOPS and some of his experiences in his early days in uh, developing some of his ideas in parapsychology. So, we will, we will, after a short break, we will get to be discussing Frank Pasciutti, an, a licensed clinical psychologist and a very good friend of mine and a colleague at DOPS and his involvement with synchronicity and parapsychological ideas. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. 
If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today, Know the Name, Know the Person, or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine such as hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a Southern Flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic downtown Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, Old Florida cuisine at its best. Welcome back to CC with BB, Connecting with Coincidence with Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. That's me. We'll, we will be talking today, we are talking today with a good friend of mine, Dr. Frank Bashuti, who is a licensed clinical psychologist and certified hypnotherapist here in Charlottesville, Virginia. He received his PhD from Michigan State and maintains a po- private practice here in Charlottesville. Over his 40 years of conducting psychotherapy, Frank's developed a subspecialty of clinically working with clientele who have undergone exceptional experiences like near-death experiences, psychic phenomena, or paranormal anomalies. Anomalies. He is a go-to guy for people in town, for, for patients who just don't know what to do with their strange, exceptional experiences. These particular clients seek to help determine if they are suffering from psychopathology or if not to find explanations that will help them understand their experiences. Many of Frank's clients also reveal synchronicity events that occur in their lives and want to explore any personal significances they may unfold for them. In his own attempt to understand synchronicity, Frank undertook research where he examined clinical conditions that may give rise to their occurrence. That research has now expanded to include numerous ways to discover how consciousness functions in humans how, and how they may explain psychic, paranormal, and spiritual experiences. Frank, welcome to the program. Oh, hi, Bernie. Thank you for having me on. It's great having you. Why don't you tell us how you got involved with the Division of Perceptual Studies? Well, you know, I always had an interest in this area of parapsychology. And um, my early uh, experiences, both in my life and then, and then early on in my doctoral training up at Michigan State University, I had the opportunity of working with a young man who had a near-death experience. Um, this was back in 1978. And the... Uh, books on near-death experiences were just starting to come into, uh, into the public's eye. Uh, so when I was working with this one fellow, he not only had this previous near-death experience, but he also um, had, had precognitions or awarenesses of events before they happened, and it scared him. And so he came into our counseling center um, at Michigan State, and um, I saw what held the potential to bring together two converging areas of interest, clinical psychology and anomalous experiences. So what what happened when I received supervision, because at this time I was still in training, my supervisor had uh, mentioned to me that there was a place in the United States, there were a couple at the time at Princeton and out in California, but she mentioned particularly that the University of Virginia was conducting such research, and that's what first uh, brought my attention to this area. And you you ran into Ian Stevenson then, uh, and you had some involvement with him and the rest of the group. What was that like? I did well. I um, I eventually made my way to Charlottesville, 
And about 20 to 25 years ago, I first sought out Dr. Stevenson because I wanted to let him know that I was interested in his research, particularly on reincarnation, but also fascinated by other other anomalous phenomena. And, at, and at for point. a little background on Ian Stevenson, uh, Ian Stevenson was chairman of the Department of Psychiatry here at the University of Virginia and decided to give it all up. He didn't want to be chairman anymore. And at a fairly young age, in his early 40s, as I remember, he um, found some money to be able to do what he most wanted to do, which was gather evidence for the possibility of reincarnation and start adopts. And that's what Frank walked into. Yes, and I have to, I have to uh, acknowledge what courage it took for Dr. Stevenson to do that back in the 60s. The things were, there wasn't as much of an open spirit, particularly in academic settings, for investigating these kinds of phenomena. No, it, it, it took a lot of courage, and and because of that, the need to be insular and careful, uh, Dobbs has had to be careful about putting their ideas out. But times certainly have changed, haven't they, Frank? Well, they sure have. It's uh, when I think about the, the years of uh, of the time I've spent looking into this, even thing, even uh, activities like meditation and yoga were still kind of on the on the periphery of embraced by most people and I think about just the difference between the 70s and now how how much more they're becoming uh, into the mainstream and I think oh, it's yeah. a wonderful thing. Oh yeah. Uh, and I, I'm sure some of our audience uh, knows Jim Tucker who has picked up on uh, Ian Stevens's work and made yet more uh, popular more into the mainstream uh, the study of uh, reincarnation. Yes, Jim has done a great job, and I remember when Jim first, uh, actually when Jim started working with Dr. Stevenson um, was when I first got more actively engaged uh, with DOPS back in the uh, middle 90s, and, uh, and Jim has done a wonderful job of, uh, of, uh, of assuming that role and also directing DOPS at this time. Yeah. Well, when I came to um, give my first talk at DOPS in 2009, um, you were there. <clears throat> we had not met until there. And, and right before that, as I recall, you um, had quite uh, an interesting coincidence experience. Why don't you tell us about that? Uh, okay. Well, that was my experience that occurred in my office. Um, and uh, I found it quite fascinating because um, – I was familiar with Jung's scarab uh, experience, and I was also also interested in like what conditions um, may exist that create the possibility of conducive a conducive environment for synchronicities or coincidences to arise. Yeah, and some of those appeared to be to be uh, some of the conditions that get established in psychotherapy. Yes, uh, you know, heightened emotion, yes. the need for guidance. And things along those lines. And, but and this was, heightened, yeah, heightened emotion. Let's go through that a little more slowly. Heightened emotion, uh, which is often correlated with a need. Uh, transition, and people in psychotherapy are often in, in transition, and they're seeking something. There's something that uh, they're, they need to be able to find an answer to or a result from. So psychotherapy is a condition in which coincidences are much more likely to happen than a lot of other situations because of those characteristics. Characteristics. I agree. And the other piece that I thought might have some relevance, I had just got through uh, doing a, 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 a review of the research on hypnosis and the conditions that give rise to uh, psychic uh, abilities. And so, you know, people uh, who have investigated uh, hypnosis and look at the um, uh, the conditions in psychotherapy will often say, in a, even within a given session, whether you're doing hypnosis or not, the heightened attention starts reflecting a hypnotic state. So I, I became more interested. I mean, I've always been interested in, in coincidences in my life, and um, uh, but the one that I had this one day was particularly outstanding. Um, I was working with a young man who was a who was a was a, a recent father having trouble in his marriage. And um, one of the complaints that his wife was making was that he seemed to not finish tasks, kept losing things, seemed to be scatterbrained and not able to stay focused on any given thing, would often run late. And he had a host of other problems. They weren't 
super serious, but they were, you know, causing difficulty in, in, in his marriage. And as I got to know him over time, it started becoming evident to me that maybe, maybe he had attention deficit disorder um, or ADHD, which would be attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity. Um, and sometimes people will feel bad about hearing that, and they'll, they'll want to say, well, it's, it's so relative to them. It's who they've been their whole life. Um, and sometimes they don't want to get diagnosed, and I'm often very cautious to do that. But this fellow also had a somewhat resistant part of him, and I said to him on a number of occasions, why don't you just go and get assessed? I don't do a formal assessment for that, but thought that would be a, uh, an important piece to understand about his treatment. But what was interesting was over a period of about oh, a month or so, having, having seen him during the stretch where we were given this consideration, I noticed that he was somewhat resistant, and so I tried to address the resistance and tried to help him understand there's nothing to be ashamed of. This is a neurological condition. It's usually genetic, and that there are drugs that can help, you know, deal with it. Well, on this particular given day, I was sitting in my office with him, and I guess I was um, losing a little of what we would call my objective, <laughs> my objectiveness, and I was leaning forward in my chair and sort of like making a plea for him, almost as if to say, you know, I'll call him Bill. Bill, why don't you just, you know, go see Dr. McClure? Now, Dr. McClure is a specialist in our town who works with attention deficit disorder, and he actually works on the same block a couple of doors away uh, in a a very different building. Um, And while I was leaning forward and making this appeal to him, suddenly my back door to my office opens. It just opened, and this woman walked into the room right in the middle. Describe your back door, how somebody could do that. Okay, well, I have uh, an office where I have a door that comes into my office through my waiting room, and then I have a back door that goes out to our parking lot. Uh, It has a little deck on it and about six steps that come up from the driveway. And interestingly, uh, not that I ever, because it's directly into my office, I have a sign underneath the handle of my door that says, uh, do not enter. And on the, on the face of one of the steps at the, about eye level, it says, not an entrance. And then all along the parking lot, there's about eight spots. Each of them are identified as belonging to this particular building, as well as another numerical indication that the building is at a, such and such a place. So anyway, this person came in, uh, walked up the steps. Neither of us were aware of it. But right in the moment, I was leaning forward and appealing to him, She opens the door and says, is this Dr. McClure's office? We both looked at each other. First of all, I got up and I was kind of shocked that all of a sudden the the sanctity of my office was was being invaded. And I sort of got up and I said, no, 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 no. He's about three or four doors down in a different building. His building's a two-story white building. This is a gold building. And, you know, uh, there's where you need to go. And I came back into the room and I looked at him and I said, well, what do you think? (laughs) <laughs> and he smiled, and I smiled, and I said, I don't know. I don't want to be like uh, magical thinking, but I think there's a certain uh, possibility that this might be an indication you need to go see Dr. McClure. <laughs> it's, it does sound like a concrete version of uh, Jung's, Jung's Scarab story. The Scarab walked into the office on this occasion with Jung. Jung had to go get the Scarab from the window, and this one, the woman – came in uh, without being asked and showed up to the guy. What was the effect on your patient? Well, what was funny is I said, wow, you know, she literally missed all the signs. You know, they were all over the place, under my yeah. door, on the steps and everything. I said, she missed all the signs. She was, And we would assume that she also was probably attention deficit disordered, uh, <laughs> wasn't paying attention to details, and impulsively just opened the door. Did not knock, by the way, just pushed the door open. It was wow. suddenly in the room. But interestingly, the fellow finally did go, I mean, he did. After that, he went to see, uh, he went to get himself assessed, and he came back, and he came came back and sheepishly said to me, he said, you know, I didn't think I was ADD. He said, but I was so ADD on how the results of this test came back. And then all of a sudden, he realized it all made sense. You know, he left all these things undone, and he finally started uh, taking, I believe it was Ritalin. He found himself so much more effective at that point. Oh. Thank you, Frank. We'll be back after a short break.
This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention, specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration, and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at... Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. Welcome back to CC with BB, Connecting with Coincidence with Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. My guest today is Dr. Frank Pesciutti, a very good friend of mine here in Charlottesville, Virginia, where we are colleagues at the Division of Perceptual Studies, which, as we've been talking about, studies reincarnation and also near-death experiences, as well, as well as other parapsychological ideas. We just talked about a woman showing up right at the right time with right, right, 
the right request that helped a patient of Frank's change his mind. And really what coincidences under the right conditions can do is flip somebody from a yes to a no or a no to, to a yes. They not only encourage certain decisions, but they provide direction for some decisions. And that's what Young Scarab did for his patients. And that's what the woman showing up at Frank's office did for his patient in getting him to go get an an assessment for ADHD. Great story, Frank. Oh, glad to share it. And you have some other stories, many of them, as we've talked about. But let's let's hear the the one about uh, your AFib uh, and the, the patient who was who you hadn't seen for such a long time. Oh yeah, sure. Well, that was an interesting occasion. Also, I um, back about twenty years ago, twenty five years ago. Uh, came to discover that I had occasion, very rare occasion, to slip into atrial fibrillation with my heart. Um, and it's not a lights-out condition, but, and it was also not a constant condition, but I did notice that for me uh, there were times if I had some heightened emotional reactions my, of my own that my heart would kick into a little uh, dysrhythmia. So, and descri um, describe what that dysrhythmia felt like, please. Well, it feels like, you know, when somebody says your heart skips a beat, you feel that little flutter in your heart. If you see somebody you love or you have a moment like that, I can feel that. Uh, but sometimes for me, it stays in that dysrhythmic condition, and it's not an usual sinus rhythm. Um, and, you know, it is a concern if you, um, are, if you sustain that for too long a period of time, your blood doesn't, uh, your heart isn't, pumping efficiently and you have to be careful and people who have AFib oftentimes will have a certain kind of ablation surgery or they have to get on a blood thinner so that they don't clot but and for me it hasn't and, been and the full name of it is atrial fibrillation which means that the atria the two top um, chambers of the heart uh, are, are vibrating too quickly they're not pumping in the in the right rhythm and as exactly. you said, that means the, you may have trouble getting enough blood to the rest of your system. Correct. And when this first occurred for me, I started suspecting, as I sh discussed with my cardiologist, that there might be an emotional precipitant, something that precedes it. But in either case, on a couple of occasions, and, and this is not uncommon for therapists, we're sensitive to the feelings of the people in the room and, and will sometimes pick up on those. Um, and even have a, a sense of if somebody comes in in fear or if somebody's sharing a sad story. You know, you start, sometimes you can feel some of that. I mean, you, you try to maintain your objectivity, but yeah. in attempting to be empathic, you can sometimes feel those feelings. Uh, yeah, well, and just to add to that, um, and those of us who are a little too empathic uh, with our, our clients or even out in the regular world um, can really be uh, hurt by some of the experiences that we em empathize with. We pick up too much of what's going on with them. So this, this very positive capacity we have of being able to feel what the other person's feeling can become a, a detriment to us sometimes. Exactly, and I was actually speaking to someone just yesterday who is considered to be an empath, somebody who has that condition, and, and a lot of our work is going towards how can she adequately like keep aware of what she's picking up from people. But what was interesting about this client, as it was with another client, is I had seen this client many years before, and one day I was feeling fine. Oftentimes if I have a reaction, I use my own response as maybe clinically indicative of what's going on with my client, yeah. or I have, to, I have to have an honest <laughs> sit down with myself and say, is anything going on here that you need to look at? But in this situation, this client walked in the door. I had already seen him for a couple of years, actually, he walked in the door. As he walked by me, I felt myself go into AFib, and I thought, well, that's interesting. And um, he sat down on the couch, and he, and he went about telling me how anxious he was about something that was going on in his life. And I thought, okay, I picked that up and sort of a little bit of a contact reaction. It had happened once before with another client. However, this particular client who came through the door and triggered that response to me, I had not seen him for five years. And... Um, one night, I was at about 11 o'clock, I was turning off the lights in my house and about to go to bed, and all of a sudden, I could tell that I went into AFib. And I mentioned to my wife, I said, wow, I, that's weird. I, I was just about to go to bed. I'm not aware of having any feelings about anything right now, and actually, I'd like to go to sleep. 
But I made note of the fact that I went into AFib, and the next morning when I got up, it largely worked itself out during the night, and I returned back to normal sinus rhythm. Good. However, Good. however, that morning, I one of the things I do first off every day, check my phone, my office phone, to find out if anybody is going to cancel any appointments or if there are any calls. And I have a call uh, from that client uh, who I had not seen for five years who said that he was having an emergency and he wondered if he could come in and see me. So I called him up and I said, sure. Wait, 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 wait. I... wait. At, the, at the moment that you, that you saw that message from him, did yes. you make the connection between him and the AFib, your AFib? No, I did not. I did you not. Did I not. actually just, I just noticed that I had, that I had this call on my line. I had, you know, and I, um, and I just called him up because I had always said to him I mean, at one point in time when we were working together, he did say that he had su suicide thoughts. And I, and as I do with all my clients, I'll say, you know, there's no, there's no wrong time to call me. If you ever have something like that happen, you call me if it's in the middle of the night, whatever. So, but he did call on my office phone and he left a message. So that next morning I invited him to come in. We sat down and he said he was in a panic. He had, he was in a relationship and that person very abruptly and in a very harsh way uh, ended the relationship the previous night. And he was basically sitting around his house thinking about taking his life and in a panic uh, decided to call me. And he said that uh, the call itself helped him just sort of not have to uh, hold on to this feeling all by himself. And I said, well, when did you make that call? Uh, unfortunately, did not have his time stamp on my uh, on my, uh, my tape machine to verify it. But he said, I called you about 11 o'clock last night. And I said, well, I, I thought to myself, that's very interesting. That was exactly the time I went into AFib. So and that, that was, was a coincidental. Yeah. Well, that's a coincidence. And when I, when I try to suggest that coincidences alert us to the mysterious hiding in plain sight, that kind of coincidence suggests a causal connection. Uh, well, how, do, how do you think that might have happened? Well, you know, again, it takes us back to what we spoke about earlier, that there might be something about a high intensity of emotion or the, re uh, or the emotional rapport you have with someone, like, for instance, maybe a good friend or a close relationship. Um, but I also, I mean, I can, I can wax philosophic and start thinking about, you know, the idea of mind and how, well, mind is, uh, there's one mind and consciousness pervades everything, that we're all swimming in this sea of consciousness. And if we have an affinity for a given person or we have a strong need or an emotional attachment that somehow um, there's a, a, a link up occurs where we might pick up. I mean, we're starting to drift into areas like telepathy uh, when we talk about how is it that, you know, this particular person having that experience, you know, uh, uh, connected with me in this indirect manner. Well, that's the right word to use, telepathy, because the original definition of telepathy was just what you described, tele meaning at a distance, and pathy meaning feeling or emotion. So this was telepathy in its original definition. What's happened since, of course, is telepathy has meant more something about ideas rather than about feelings, but this was the original definition. As you know, I have... I have coined a term called simulpathity, which means feeling at the same time, usually at a, at a distance, not at the same, not empathy at the same, at, at being in the same room, feeling at a feeling someone's pain at a distance, simulpathity. You like the term telesomatic, which has been around also to describe the same thing. So this is within the, the psi, the, the uh, telepathy, clairvoyant kind of experience where we feel something we, of someone else who we're connected with somehow in ways we can't quite explain. One of the mysteries of, of of uh, current science regarding parapsychology is just how do we explain experiences like this, telepathy, simulpathy, uh, clairvoyance, how do we explain them? We now know they happen. Uh, there's plenty of data from Dean Radin and others that this sort of thing happens a lot, and experiences like yours are are countless. Uh, my research has shown uh, these to be quite common, yet because we can't explain them, we dismiss them. 
Well, we have the similar problem with uh, the universe and dark energy and dark matter. Um, movements of celestial bodies could not be explained by uh, the then current uh, ideas about uh, how they should work. So uh, astronomers and astrophysicists came up with the idea of black matter, uh, dark matter and dark energy because they needed something to explain the strange movements of uh, celestial bodies. They don't know what dark energy and dark matter is, but they know something's got to be there. And we are in the same place with telesomatic or simopathy or psi ideas, but because they're about us, because we have specific fixed ideas about how things work and don't, we don't let the mystery in and try to study it more. We need more funding to be able to understand how the experience you just described, Frank, took place. Well, that's, a, that, that, that's an excellent summary of, of the state of, of, of the science of it all. And I think that one of the critical pieces when it comes to trying to convey to people that these, these are real, actual occurrences uh, is that people seem to have a difficult time making sense of them. They defy time, space, and causality as we know it. Yeah. And oftentimes, unless you have your own personal experience with it, yeah, yeah. it's hard to verify it. And yes. so part of my subspecialty, as you know and mentioned earlier, is that people will come in here, so oftentimes they'll reach out to DOPS and say, I've had these experiences, and I know that you all research them, but as you and I both know, DOPS is a research uh, organization. They don't do therapy, so oftentimes I will get referrals from them. And these people will come in and they're frightened. That they, many times these things lead to what they call a spiritual emergency. They yeah. actually go into crisis. They worry that they're losing their mind. And if they don't have an explanation, they, they start getting paranoid. But many times, as you mentioned, Dean Radin, you know, there's a, a continuum of what might be considered abnormal, what's considered normal, and what's considered supernormal. And these kind of fall into sort of a supernormal range. They're they psychic do. They do. capacities, but yeah. they're outside of normal range of functioning, but they're not necessarily abnormal. And that's what you and I and many others are trying to be able to suggest. And as you implied, while there's plenty of data out there, currently the only way to get people to pay attention is if, if and when they have their own experiences and they wonder about them and they come up with the fact that they had this experience and then find other people have also had this experience. So then they become to believe that yes, they are somehow real. Even though we can't explain them, they happen. So let's put our energy and our, uh, and our money in trying to be able to understand how these things happen because they're out there and they help us understand consciousness and they probably can be a big help in trying to be able to make the world yet even a better place because there's a lot of need for that now. So we will be back after a short break talking with Dr. Frank Pichuti and we'll go on to talking about the I Ching and related ideas. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 
401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? I'm Dr. Kimberly McGeorge, and on The Secret to Everything, we will merge the practical with open investigation into all realms of the mysterious. We will talk to cutting-edge alternative health practitioners, those who inspire and motivate you in business and life, and of course, we will share stories of the paranormal, conspiracy, and cryptozoology. You will transform because of the frequency I carry, the frequencies my guests carry. Life may never be the same after you listen to this program, for the secret to everything is for you, the listener, for those who desire more in every area of their lives and believe that it can still be found. Listen and discover the secret to everything.com. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at Songs and Stories for Soldiers. Soldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Welcome back to CC with BB, the only radio show in the world dedicated to the study of coincidences, synchronicity, and serendipity. It's my great pleasure to have my very good friend, Dr. Frank Pesciutti, on the program with me. We've talked about two very interesting coincidences of his involving uh, psychotherapy clients of his. Uh, we both recognize, as do many other clinicians, that coincidences are likely to happen within the psychotherapeutic relationship, and we have had such experiences. But Frank has many other interests, um, and they are they, some of them are relate to his interest in the I Ching. Uh, Carl Jung was very interested in the I Ching, and, and he wrote. Uh, Jung wrote the um, introduction to uh, Wilhelm's classic work on the I Ching. Uh, it was uh, it was his first real foray, Jung's, into trying to define what he meant by synchronicity. And, and the I Ching, of course, is based on a Chinese philosophy. Uh, the the Tao for the most part. And it was in that ancient Chinese philosophy that Jung came to learn something about what he, what he was studying personally as uh, meaningful coincidences. He noticed uh, that within Chinese philosophy that 
the the Tao didn't look for causal events like A caused B, but rather looked at how things clustered, how events all happened at the same time. And for Jung and for the Chinese before him, synchronicity meant falling together in time, sing together, sync in time, sing together, cron in time, falling together in time. So it's a different causal connection than A causes B. Somehow things cluster together. And the I Ching is based on this idea that that the I Ching is a reading of all the things happening right now. It's a, a mirror of the present. So, Frank, how do you think the I Ching operates? I Ching operates. Please describe how it's done and how you think it operates and what you've done it with it yourself. Well, um, that was an excellent summary of what the I Ching is about. And basically, uh, as you said, it. The Taoist philosophy is how is it that these two things or these events come together or why is it that they come together in time? Uh, and so the I Ching basically um, takes, you know, some pretty profound statements of Taoist philosophy, uh, almost like a poetry. Uh, and there it, 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 it is um, laid out in 64, what are called 64 hexagrams. And, and the idea of the, the I Ching is a, what is called kind of a, it's a divinatory process. Some people will say that they wake up in the morning, they think of a question, they spin the pages of the Bible, and then they read whatever, you know, whatever verse comes up. And oftentimes they'll say, isn't it coincidental that this particular verse comes forward just at the time when I needed this guidance? Well, yeah. it's a little bit like that. It is. However, it is. the, yeah, the I Ching has a process where, where, as Jung noted, that you purposely engage in a coin-throwing technique to assure for the uh, randomness of whatever uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the numbers that come up will direct you to any one of those 64 hexagrams, and then within each one there are six further subdivisions of points that are made in reference to that hexagram. So oftentimes you basically try to sit with yourself, and ask yourself, you know, where and in what way you might need some guidance, and you try to affirm that, and then you throw the coins, and then you basically um, compute which particular hexagram uh, comes up, and then you read it, and as if you were unpacking poetry, you, you look at it with more of an intuitive eye to see if it stirs in you anything that can bring insight into your question. Yes, um, and, yes, and, and when we go back as you're talking to the idea of randomness, the, the tossing of the six coins is looks like it's random because you don't know what's going to come up, but it's it's in that randomness that there is order, and that's the contradiction of all this. That on the edge of chaos, there there is there is order, uh, and this idea has been around now for a while in complexity theory. But you throw the coins, and to me, the way I think about it, and I I've, I used to do tarot card readings, is that the Tao is a river a river that flows through time and through us. And throwing those coins or, th or throwing the cards of the tarot deck uh, is like throwing up a, a mirror into this river so that we can see what's going on with us in the present. Yes, yes. And, um, and what's fascinating about that, um, as you know, we did some uh, research uh, together. Yes. Um, there are times where it's uncanny yeah. that you get a particular hexagram, and the chances of that one particular hexagram being one in 64, um, oftentimes that's called an apposite, which is spelled with an A, different than opposite. And, it's, it, it, and, and when you look at the times, the people who use the I Ching will often say it's uncanny how many times the, they got exactly what they needed, which takes you back to that notion of need and how need may activate, especially if you have an emotional need yeah. for guidance, how that can play a part in bringing forth what you need through the medium of uh, a divinatory process and a, uh, and a book of readings that has the profound breadth that would give you you know, some insight into what your question is about. Yep, 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 yep. So you, you, you've used the I Ching yourself. 
I have. And I'll, I'll, uh, yes, I have. And it was interesting um, uh, to see. And, and I've kept track of all the questions I've asked for the last 40 years. Really? With hexagram. <laughs> oh, I have a detailed account of it all. I keep it. I just keep it because I feel like on some level it's interesting to just go back and look at where I was five years ago, what questions I was asking, and what kind of guidance I was getting. It sort of like provides a retrospective uh, uh, validity <laughs> measure uh, that I have felt yeah. many times that, uh, that it prompted within me uh, something that maybe was percolating up from my own unconscious, but I needed to have the activation of the process to bring it into my awareness. Very interesting. It's like a dream journal, or I encourage people to do coincidence journals for the same reason, just to see the consistencies in the patterns. Uh, the, you did some research with the I Ching, too, um, that uh, we published uh, uh, in Psychiatric uh, Annals. Um, and some of the we have about uh, less than four minutes left, so uh, if you could summarize. Uh, what you found, and I think of particular interest to me was the personality types uh, that that you know so well uh, from the Myers Myers Briggs that correlated uh, with some of the outcomes. Well, yes, and that and, and those psychological types were based on Jung's theory of psychological types, yes. and yes. It, it, it it actually evidenced that under a controlled conditions with a double blind. Uh, protocol where my where after my cl I helped my client identify a, a question that really had a an emotional significance in their life and had them uh, throw the coins out uh, with being blindfolded as I was being blindfolded and then we were randomly given um, you know hexagrams from the book that were not generated along with the one that was generated and how they um, how each of us after we were familiar with the question tried to identify which might have been the actual hexagram that was thrown and more and beyond chance we actually did identify that uh, the one que the one hexagram in the four that we were given um, that actually was thrown but the interesting thing was that certain types did it incre at an incredibly high level they tended to be more introverted which means they were tending to be more attuned to their internal process, like introverts, rather than flowing out like an extrovert might. They were intuitive, uh, which is another uh, form of perception that Jung identified. In other words, they were open to more impressions rather than over-focused on details. They were more likely to be what we call feelers as opposed to thinkers, more tuned to feeling than logic and analysis. Although we use all these functions, there's a preference for one or the other. And they were, in the last function, they were open to, um, to uh, le la less structure and more open to spontaneity. And they actually uh, identified the hexagram that they threw without knowing it 50% um, of the time, which is pretty high. Now, I've not replicated that only because I haven't had a chance to get back and do that research uh, to this other book that I'm working on right no. now, but I, I would like to just identify those we, particular people. We only have a minute left. Uh, that, that that research or, or two minutes left. This this is a research. Let me summarize it. Um, the 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 subject uh, threw the coins and came up with uh, a hexagram, was but didn't know what it was, and then was presented with uh, four hexagrams and was asked to pick which one did you throw, and uh, they were able to guess pretty well, but the group that you described, which is intuitive, uh, uh, intro, uh, introverted, um, open to new ideas, um, and one other thing, uh, and more emotional, I'm going to think, um, t did it about 50% of the time. So there's something about this openness uh, is what I'm going to say, the openness to uh, things without being too rational, without being too glued to the external things that uh, makes people more able to pick up that, uh, that one out of four uh, hexagrams that they threw. Exactly. So that it starts, even though it's not causative, you start thinking about are there conditions that are conducive to uh, – allowing for the uh, synchronistic occurrence of events to transpire, you know. Uh, that's, even, 
De definitely. Intuitive is one of them that I've been able to find, but this is even more finely tuned than what I've been able to, than what I came up with. Uh, th this is, a, uh, we've talked about this before, but somehow this came out a little more clearly uh, about the personality types that are more likely to not only be intuitive, not only do the I Ching, but to be more likely to pick up coincidences. Uh, and, and we are. Let me say one last thing. Okay, just we got, remember we can, everybody has those functions. So uh, you, you, they may be more dormant, but they are all able to be activated. Very good. Thank, thank you very much, Frank, for being with us today. On